I'm here, I'm at the end of the garden, I might as well do some mailbag sessions while I'm sitting here chilling out and drinking gin. In actual fact, I'm not on my own. One of the housemates is just sitting off camera over there, but she's a bit shy and she won't jump this side of the camera. So, um, Auntie threatened to turn the camera around, and at which point she threatened to run away. And, and since she's got the bottle of the gin, um, that's not a good idea. But so remember, this is mailbag. These are questions. These are comments that you leave on the channel. I'm getting lots of them. I'm getting lots of technical comments, comments and questions at the moment which require me to do a little bit of research. I probably know the answer straight off cuff, but I really do want to have a, look, have a quick check on the, on the piece of equipment to make sure that I'm not giving you duff information. Um, I'm always open and honest. If I don't know, I don't know. Um, but just bear with me if uh, you've raised a query and I haven't responded pretty quickly. Uh, it probably means I need to go and refer back to something. Anyway, nor parish notices apply. So... If you haven't hit the subscribe icon, why not? Go subscribe. If you want to be notified about uh, when content is published by me or maybe Bill or Ben behind me, then hit that bell icon. If you want to support the channel, um, and that's supporting the buying of old equipment to run uh, restoration projects on, etc., then head on over to Patreon. Every dollar is well received by me. Uh, and is always always put towards the running of this channel. So that's www.patreon.com forward slash the music tech guy. There's only one of me. And finally, we are still in COVID-19 lockdown, um, even though some people have gone back to work and some people think, um, given it's bank holiday weekend, that it's okay to go and sort of like be crammed in like sardines on the beach. Uh, it's still stay, stay alert, stay safe. Wash the hands until we're told otherwise. So, back to the main part of this video. So, the first one for this section comes from uh, Tony Jackson. Uh, and this is in response to a video I did beginning of May 2020, which was about opening up the S330 and looking around what's in the box. Um, and I've had another question, actually, which I'm going to answer at the same time, which is why do I open the boxes up? And it's very simple, actually. When I open a piece of legacy tech, I have no idea who's had it, who's been repairing it, who's done what to it. So the reason I open the box up and I sort of kind of do it on camera is just to make the video. But there is actually another reason for doing it, and the other reason for doing it is so that I can actually have a good nose around inside and look for things like burn marks and char marks and leaky capacitors and stuff like that. Uh, and also very, very bad soldering, I might add. I find that quite often. Anyway, um, in response to that particular video, he writes, Hi, John. Um, I've decided to take on repairing and installing what I can myself, and I got an S330 and an S10 for little of nothing. Um, the S10 has no power cable, got that, uh, and she fired up right next, to ha right next up, have to get those quick discs for it. Well... You're going to have fun doing that because they're, sc they're scarce as in a thingy, whatever. Um, the Roland S330 power cable was cut, so he's written cute, but I think he means cut. So since I have to change the cable, I'm putting in a three-pin connector instead, which is the right thing to do, I might add. Um, put in a, a universal uh, IC. Um, and I have a bunch of those cables from my computer, yeah. So the cord was cut, soldered to the power supply, and it's uh, the Roland three pin, two pin setup. It has two wires inside it. What about third wire ground? That's question one. Um, is there something that the, this can be screwed into, uh, i.e. the bottom of the case? Can I put the ground wire from the three pin connector under the same uh, screw? Second question is, the Roland S330 and S10 were not SCSI, correct? Um, have you seen how they're set up or programmed? Quick disk floppy emulator from GoTech is for the S10 and a GoTech USB floppy drive emulator FDE for the S330. So, um, so let's start with question one. Uh, so if you look at that particular video, the S330 video um, about what was in the box, if you look at 17 minutes and 39 seconds in, I put a series of pictures at the end of the video, and each picture runs for about 10 seconds. Um, but if you look at that particular point, you'll see a photograph of the power supply board, and that's my power supply board, which has a three-pin connector on it. And if you look 
to the, as you're looking at the photograph, top right of the screen, you'll see a screw that's mounted to the chassis, and the earthing cable is connected to that particular screw. So that's the earthing point for a three-pin connector. Um, so that, that's the first part. The second thing I would say is, if you haven't got one, I'd get yourself a crimping set, and I'd actually put a proper terminal on the end of the earthing wire, so that when you effectively loop it over the screw and lock it down, that earthing wire is locked down, it's not coming out. So you should be good to go. That's the first, that's what I would do anyway. Um, second question about the SCSI interface. Um, you're absolutely right that there was no SCSI interface for the S10 and the S330. Um, I kind of find it a bit odd for the S330 because there was a SCSI interface for the S50 and there's a SCSI interface for the F550. Uh, the S30 came out after the S50 and after the S550. And it was kind of meant to be a bit of a halfway house between the two because it had the same amount of memory as the S50, but it had the same filters and effects as the S550. And a lot of people tell me, um, with authority, I might add, that the S550 was the rat mount unit of the S50, and I beg to disagree with them because the S550 had more memory and it had a different filter arrangement. Uh, which means it was an upgrade to the S550, the S50, not its rack mount equivalent. Um, but a lot of manufacturers around that time tended to take the keyboard away and make the rack mount more powerful. Um, and then that made the dilemma for the musician, which is, well, did you buy the keyboard version and lose some of that functionality, or did you buy the rack mount version and have to buy a keyboard? Um, now, I know if I was in that situation, I'd probably buy the rack mount and suffer the keyboard because MIDI is MIDI. Anyway, I'm, I'm going completely off the point. Um, for the S10, the quick disk format is very scarce. Now, there are some of UK, end of May, May bank holiday, um, I had a quick skirt through eBay a couple of days ago, and there is somebody at the moment selling um, Roland Sound Library quick disk format um, so if you're quick, you can get it. You can get those quick discs because they are becoming very, very scarce. Um, and I thought three and a half inch floppies were becoming a pain in the thingy to get hold of, but trying to get hold of blank quick discs, believe you me, is 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 becoming very, very difficult. And it kind of sort of sends the the death knell, I think, to the S10. Um, machine and the MKS-100. Now, I was offered an MKS-100 oh, literally within the last month, and I turned it down for, this is the second time I've turned down the offer of, a, uh, of acquiring this uh, MKS-100. And the problem I have is, I don't really want to sort of like start investing in quick disks. You know, I've got an investment in three and a half inch floppies because I've got a number of machines that use them, the Ensonic machines use them, the Yamaha machines use them, the Korg machines use them. Um, and the roller machines all use sort of three and a half inch floppies. So I'm quite happy to sort of have the investment in them, but I'm not going to have an investment in quick disc for one machine. Um, and I know there was a couple of other musical instruments around the same time that use quick disc, but the likelihood of me, likelihood of me buying them is pretty slim. So, um, and I think you're right to go go down the GoTech drives um, devices. Uh, make sure that when you buy a GoTech device for the particular keyboard, you buy it from a seller who is, has enough nows to be able to modify it for you. So I'll give you a good example of that. The the SY85 that I've just finished the restoration pro project on, um, that has a 24-pin, well, it's 24-pin ZIF connector, and the drive I've replaced, uh, in or the new drive I've just put into the SY85, is a standard 34-pin floppy connector. So I've had to have it converted from floppy to ZIF format so that the SY85 will operate because that's the original format. It was this 24-pin ZIF format. Um, so again, if you're going to put a GoTet drive in, quite often the manufacturers, being little darlings that they potentially were at the time, did little tricks in terms of things like swapping pins around. So just watch out for that. Um, and a typical GoTech drive is designed to replace a floppy on a drive-for-drive -drive basis. So it will be a standard 
34 pin PC style floppy connection. Okay. Um, so I've, you know, as I said, I've kept most of my devices a standard three and a half inch floppy. The reason for that is, yes, I get the whole idea of GoTech. GoTech really does make a lot of sense. Um, but the reason why I've kind of kept three and a half inch floppy is now I've got a good supply of floppy disk drives or floppy disks, um, which are which are new. So I'm sort of kind of sitting there thinking these, these are going to last a while. Great. Um, if the disk drives do eventually go bang, then hopefully I can get replacements. And if I can't, then maybe something like a GoTech, because I've now personally because of the disk library stuff I've been doing, I've sussed how do you actually move uh, from one format to the other, and I can create the images that will go on the GoTech drive. Um, I don't see it being that easy for other people to do so unless they go through the same pain that I went through. Um, so yeah. Um, and as I say, the biggest, the biggest pain in the thing for this is you actually need a PC, a target PC, um, to create the images to go on the GoTech USB drive. So yes, you can sample stuff in, that's all well and good, and you would create those, that's kind of how the sample is meant. But if you're looking to sort of start with lock stock samples um, that came from the Roland Library or came from somewhere else, um, unless you've got a PC with a floppy drive um, that is able to actually read the software, and this is really key actually. I've done lots of videos recently about operating systems no longer supporting particular pieces of software. Um, then you could be up thingy without a paddle. Anyway, let me know how you get on. Be interesting. Be very interesting. Okay, next one from Steve Waite in response to um, the Yamaha SY85 Part 4 battery replacement, which uh, only went live um, about a week ago. And uh, he writes, great video, thanks. What data, if any, has been lost undertaking this procedure? Well, pretty much when you pull the battery on the S185, you lose everything. Um, so if you've got any custom sounds in there, if you've got anything else in there that you want to preserve, you need to back it up before you do the, the restore or the, before you pull the battery out. Um, that's pretty much it. So you either do a SysX or you dump it to disk. Otherwise, you will lose the lot. Um, and the other side of the battery replacement process is once you've done the battery replacement, you then need a factory disk to restore the factory, all the factory settings to the, the machine so that the machine can actually then start to operate again. Um, so in, all, in, in, in basic language, you need, you'll lose everything. You need a new battery, and you need the factory restore disk as well. I'll stop the video before actually getting on to the second question. <laughs> Um, so Steve then writes back and says, uh, luckily my keyboard is not complaining about battery backup yet. Unfortunately, I do not have the factory disks or memory modules. I'm waiting for them for arrival of some 2D D, well, double density dip floppies uh, to test the floppy drive if all is working okay. I can, I, I can make a copy of the factory free sets from the keyboard. Um, so first thing is I will be offering the media replacement service on the SY85. I've got the disks have been copied up onto the library. I just need to copy them down onto uh, new floppy, new media. Um, so that's the first thing. And I'm again standard offering, which will be five pound a disk for the factory disk and five pound for the demonstration. Um, now, how do you know that you've got the factory set on the machine when you acquired it? Uh, you don't. It's as simple as that. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I tend to do a factory restore on most of my equipment um, when I acquire it, because I have no idea what somebody has done to that machine uh, since it came from the factory. Um, so they could have changed parameters. And I've had, I've had, I've, I, I came to this conclusion after buying a piece of equipment secondhand from somebody, and then going to kick it. And I got to the point where I set everything up, everything was working well, I thought everything should work, how everything should work, should I say. And midway through a set, I pressed the button and all of a sudden this keyboard just went nuts. Um, and it did all kinds of weird things with my patch setup. 
Um, and that was purely because somebody had, had changed a parameter, this button then registered to do something, and when I hit the button by mistake, it did exactly what it was designed to do. So I just have this policy of when I acquire a new piece of kit, I tend to take it back to factory. Um, that's not, you know, all right, you get rid of some people's sounds and what have you, and sometimes there's stuff worth keeping which I sort of siphon off. Um, but most of the time, it's back to factory. At least that way I know when I press a button, that it's gonna, it's not gonna go weird on me. Now, as I say, I don't really gig anymore, but um, that's just past experience, really, sort of telling me that's the right thing to do. I think this is the last one for this section, isn't it? Is it? Uh, no, there's one more. So the next one is from Sean Curran, and this is in response to a mailbag I did. Old samplers, monitors. A80, uh, don't stick that on me, function heist, I remember this one. Um, so, Sean says, great points, thanks for covering my question. Uh, you're welcome. I've got my eye on an S um, something sim uh, sampler, but not without a mouse or monitor. I'm staying clear of the boutique series for the, those very reasons. Um, so, what Sean is, con is, is commenting on is the fact that there have been a number of mailbags recently where people have said, I can't get so-and-so to operate with my Mac version 15 Catalina. And to be honest, there are a number of things going on, most of which are being caused by Apple and Roland. Uh, first is Apple have been upgrading their software so they only, will only work with 60, software that is written in 64-bit language. Uh, no, that's wrong. Software that is written to a 64-bit standard is right. And the second thing is that Roland have dropped support for many legacy pieces of tech uh, and are not updating the drivers so they will work with the 64-bit operating system. Um, and that was kind of the issue that was being called out. I'm not buying the boutiques because, you know, what do I, you know, how do I know that in a couple of years' time Apple will do another upgrade for some reason and all of a sudden Roland stop upgrading the USB drivers and all of a sudden you're high and dry with your boutique. And this is very true. This is very, very true. Back in the day, MIDI was MIDI. Your, computer, your keyboard didn't connect your computer in any intelligent way like it does now with USB. And because of that, you know, those keyboards still work and we're now starting to find the USB keyboards are starting to fall off a cliff. Brilliant. Um, and, and basically, I mean, I, I have to say, until on, honestly, until recently, until these questions started coming along, I really hadn't considered this at all, um, the USB, but the OS upgrades have stopped equipment working, and it really annoys me. It really does annoy me, because I think you and I, as a you know, hard-working person, have decided to put their hand in their pocket and buy a piece of equipment that now because the manufacturer decides they're not going to support it and because of the way they implemented the USB on that piece of equipment, you're effectively stuck with a piece of equipment that is pretty much useless um, uh, in trying to work with that piece of equipment in the way it was originally designed to work, i.e. via USB. Um, I am concerned about the, UT the boutiques stop working in the future. None of the boutiques are class compliant, which basically means that a class compliant piece of equipment, the operating system will recognize the equipment, all the information about the equipment is contained within the equipment itself, so the operating system doesn't have to do anything, it's literally just plug and play and away you go. Um, unfortunately, the way Roland have implemented um, a lot of the boutique equipment and the ARIA equipment is you have to have some sort of Roland software on your machine to uh, tell the machine how to interact. Um, in terms of samplers, um, they kind of represent the cutting edge of technology at the point of production. Um, higher number in the range, so if you buy an S770, which was the flagship sampler of the Roland range at that point in time, um, you'll get much better quality than you would have got on an S10. But it's kind of... Horses, of course, you'll pay more money for a second hand S70 than you will for a second hand S10. Um, plus, the fact that you've got things like the S10 uses a, a legacy drive format, which is the quickest format, which we talked about earlier on. 
in this particular mailbag. Um, but you do, for all of these samplers, need the mouse. And I would say for the more, so definitely for the S750 that I've got, you need the RC100 remote control unit as well because it just makes it so much easier to work with the device. Anyway, if you want to get all the features, that's what you've got to do. The last one for this section is from Eric Lafont. That's a great name. Uh, in response to the Roland TR-08, how to update the firmware, I did way back in December 2017. I can't really believe I've had the TR-8 three years. Well, nearly three years. Um, he writes, thank you. How can I record into my computer? Um, so, first thing you need, if you want to record from the Roland TR-8, you need the Roland drivers installed on your computer. Because if you don't have the Roland drivers installed, it won't present the multi-channels of USB. Let me just move it this way because the sun is now setting over there. Um, and it's kind of the reason why you want the TR-8 because you want to be able to take the bass drum, the snare drum and the toms, etc., into the TR-8 uh, as separate channels and then plumb them into your door. That's kind of what you want. Um, so you need, the, you need the, the Roland software installed to present those channels of USB up. Um, and the TR-8 actually will generate 12 audio channels into your door. So there's 12 channels you can assign. Um, and you can either assign them separately or you can assign them to one channel. But it seems to be pointless presenting 12 channels of USB if all of a sudden you decide that you're not going to uh, this one a bit more, um, use it. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Um, the other way of recording it, of course, is it's, got a st it's just got a s simple stereo out. You plumb the stereo out into some sort of audio card and you record it that way. But it seems a bit daft to do that, given that you get 12 channels of audio over USB and it's all running digital. Anyway, that's how you do it. And for this section of the mailbag, live long and prosper. See you again. Thank you.